And we are live. All right. This is pretty cool. I'm just going to do a few checks. Um, OK, I see the audio is going. I see the camera is going. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the Tea Crane. I'm Tia Sosen, and today we have a special guest. And we'll be talking about Japanese tea. Um, we haven't done many lives. We haven't talked a lot about the, uh, the various aspects of what Japanese tea, and especially what I'm looking at as an uh, organic Jap uh, Japanese tea, how I perceive that, what that is. And I, there are a lot of questions um, about what Japanese tea is. So I thought we'd um, do a live. We have uh, half an hour, an hour maybe, and uh, we'll just get on with uh, answering some questions, sipping some tea. So I would say... Yeah, sit back, relax, get yourself uh, some tea going and uh, join us for uh, the chat. You can also, we've got some, uh, yep, here we can, we can receive your comments. So if you have questions, then, uh, oh, look, here we go. Hey, Tom, thanks. <laughs> See, hello from Thailand. So uh, from all over the world, you can join us. You can send us some questions and uh, you can join the chat. All right. So... I actually don't know what um, exactly we'll be talking about. I haven't seen all the questions yet. Um, Dinya here has uh, gathered some questions and uh, she will be doing the interviewing today. So I'm actually uh, pretty interested to see what we are going to be talking about. I'm also doing the uh, computer work at the same time. So I'll be looking in different directions. And uh, all right, well, then how about you introduce yourself and uh, maybe give a little introduction about, well, tell me as well what we are going to be doing today. <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, my name is Linnea. I'm from the United States originally, but I live here in Kyoto now. And I've been interested in tea for quite a while, probably about 10 years now. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I started to really get interested in uh, you know, the specifics um, and, you know, high quality or uh, organic tea more recently in the last couple of years. And I stumbled upon this shop here kind of coincidentally, and I recently started helping out here in my free time. Um, and I thought uh, I got, I've been getting a lot of information about organic teas and how tea is produced. And uh, I thought it would be nice to share some of that knowledge. So today our topic is uh, we're going to be talking about why green tea especially, but other teas as well, why they can turn bitter when not brewed properly. What causes that and hmm. how you can avoid it and all sorts of things regarding that topic. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds exciting. There's a lot to be said about that. And I think there's, there's a lot, that, lot of directions that we can go as well. So, um, well, before we head on, let's continue on with some, uh, some green tea. This is still not the main one that I want to be brewing. So I'll get the main one out as well. <clears throat> and oh, I'll get another QC as well first. Okay. <clears throat> So without any further ado, well, let's get into it. Some ado. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So to start off, uh, when people start getting into tea and they start learning about tea and drinking tea, one of their main hurdles, I think, is mm. how to brew a tea to make it taste good. And especially green tea can be hard. So, uh, for example, it's recommended to use a certain amount of tea and a certain amount of water brew it at 80 degrees Celsius or uh, about steaming rather than fully boiling, et cetera, et cetera. So mm. how do you personally brew tea, a, pot, a, a green tea? How do you brew it? Wait, you're asking me how I brew green tea? Yes. What, what does green tea mean? <laughs> right, so there's a lot of different kinds so you have a different way for each uh new tea i assume so how do you approach yes. a new tea for example so well that the, the question itself is is pretty broad because we're talking about and i, and I can see that question is uh <clears throat> is out there as well like 
you want to brew green tea, but there's so many different varieties of green tea. There's you have sencha, you have kabusecha, you have gyokuro, um, and even within the same type of sencha, you have different kinds of sencha that might also benefit from a different brewing approach. So if we would say look at sencha itself, generally the approach is to take um, a water temperature of about 80 degrees. So you would slightly cool down your water. And the temperature that you take with uh, sencha is, um, well, if you brew kabusecha, then you take a lower temperature again. And uh, that should be around 70 degrees. And then with gyokuro, you take a lower temperature again, which is between 50 to 60 degrees. That is the common standard. But it's technically not how I approach most of the brewing of um, the teas that I drink, because I see each tea as an individual possibility. Every tea comes from a different background. So if it's grown in the south of Japan or in the center of Japan around here in Kyoto or Nara, then again, it's different. The, the cultivars that you use um, are different as well. The type of soil composition is different. The way they, uh, the farms are positioned on the mountain flanks is different. And all those aspects, they affect really what kind of tea you're going to obtain in the end. And so you want to take a different brewing approach to that as well. And we also have to see, of course, to are we brewing a tea that is organically grown and how has it been grown, which is an important factor to understand what kind of flavor components and aroma components the tea has. Because most conventional teas are mostly focused around creating a thick umami flavor. So you want to brew that tea in a way that you can extract that umami flavor and don't have too much bitter flavors and that you can just enjoy that sweet, lush, um, pleasant kind of tea flavor. But with organic teas, I think I should explain this first. With organic tea, what you want to do is to not fertilize the tea. So if... Um, you don't want to fertilize it too much. No, let me go back here. You don't want to spray pesticides on the tea. That's basically what organic means. So in order to not to have to spray pesticides, you begin by lowering the amount of fertilization that you add to the soil, which then again um, lowers the flavor components that are present in the tea. So if you are going to produce an organic tea that is similar to a conventional tea, then you have to use a lot of fertilizer because otherwise you can't keep up with producing that um, immense amount of umami flavor. So inevitably, organic teas tend to be lighter in flavor. They don't have that strong umami flavor. So understanding that that is a trait of organic tea production, you also approach the way that you brew it in a different way. So Let's say we have an, um, a conventional tea here in front of us, that one, a conventional sencha that we want to brew. You say, okay, we know it's been fertilized in a way to create umami flavors. If a tea is fertilized, it is fertilized with mostly nitrates. Those nitrates are added to the soil and then get into the roots of the tea, uh, of the tea tree. And it is used to produce the young new buds, the young tea leaf. So those nitrates help to produce a higher amount of amino acids in the tea. Amino acids help to create a umami flavor. But those amino acids, when they get into the tea leaf, through photosynthesis, those amino acids change into catechin. So if we look at the process there, you see that Adding a lot of fertilizer enhances the amount of amino acids that can be present in a tea leaf, but also enhances the amount of amino acids that can, through photosynthesis, be changed into catechin, which inevitably, with a conventional tea, will not only make your tea sweeter, but also more bitter. And if you then brew that tea, you just brew it with hot water, you both extract those enhanced amino flavors as well as 
the catechin bitterness. So inevitably, you need to find an approach to only get those amino acids, those, uh, that umami flavor. And that is how they've come to the 80 degree rule, where <laughs> under 80 degrees, amino acids release, but catechins don't. Catechins stay, most of it, in the tea leaf. So if you want to brew a conventional tea deliciously to only get those aminos, you want to reduce the amount of, um, well, the temperature that you're brewing the tea with. Mm -hmm. Now, for most organic or naturally grown teas, they haven't gone through that process of fertilization and enhancement of both the amino acids and the catechins, which means that they only have a natural amount of both. So if you are going to brew that organic tea with a temperature lower than 80 degrees, you already are going to miss out on a lot of flavors and aromas because you're extracting something that isn't there. You can't expect an organic tea to have amino flavors because you're not fertilizing it. So you have to approach it in a different way. And that approach to me is mostly to brew the tea with a higher temperature, almost boiling, 98 degrees, 100 degrees, and for a shorter period so that you can get more of those catechins out as well as the amino acids and as the aromas. And you enjoy more of that. And that's how I approach the uh, organic teas that I drink. So to answer your question, for each tea and each type of tea, I think you need to understand the background of where the tea comes from, how it's being grown, and what kind of flavor components the tea has in order to create a um, uh, brewing approach to it. So through understanding all of those background factors, mm -hmm. uh, you brew each tea based on those rather than a set rule, a set of rules, like a standard set for each, for all the teas. Decide mm. based on each tea individually. Yes. I try to approach each tea individually because I think each tea has an individual character. Now, over the years, I had, I have developed some of an, um, a similar approach to similar categories of tea. So within Sencha, if they're organically grown, I know they're not fertilized. I use a higher temperature, shorter brewing period. With Yokuro, I like to play around, depending on whether it's been produced to be, um, even with organic teas, I like to look at the possibility if, if it's cultivated to have a lot of umami flavor. So it's organically fertilized, it's been cared for so that it reaches as close as possible to conventional gyokuro. Then I'll try with brewing it with colder temperature first, around 60 degrees, and then rapidly increase. I would usually take 60 degrees first, 80 degrees, and then 100. Is that for subsequent ste steepings of the For tea? subsequent steepings of the same tea leaf. Um, is that also true for different kinds of teas, such as black teas or oolong teas? Is there a sort of a guideline or is it? Well, I approach those completely different again, yes. But for, in generally, um, do, they, do you have sort of a standard set of rules for those kind of teas? A standard set of rules. Well, we can, we can create a standard set of rules if, if we want to. Um, Well, if I try a tea for the first time, what I would do is um, I would definitely, well, you see, I do drink a lot of teas and every time I approach a new tea, what I would do is I brew it and I'm always in contact with the tea, I'm always talking with the tea. There's like this um, inaudible conversation going on here where I'm always talking, but the other people don't hear it. And the tea is telling me things too. So I'm brewing it, I'm pouring the water. The tea tells me how hot it needs to be. The tea tells me how long it needs to steep. And when it's ready, then the tea says, um, I'm ready. I'm ready. So I... Um, I uh, then I pour it out. 
Yeah. And so it's basically all guided by the T itself. Mm. And I know it sounds ridiculous. I know it, this sounds ridiculous because how can it be talking to the T? The T is not telling you anything. It's, it's an inanimate object that, but there's this, um, this understanding of tea that I've cultivated over the years. And through drinking a lot of tea and knowing what the tea is that I'm brewing here, I can relate back to that prior knowledge. And based on that, I can see, well, how is this tea grown? What type of soil has been used? How has it been fertilized? What is the cultivar? What type of tea is it? Is it sencha? Is it kabusit? Is it yogurt? Is it black tea? Is it oolong tea? Then I can relate back to other types of teas that somewhat have a similar um, background and mm -hmm. say, well, then for the first time brewing, I'm going to approach it this way. Mm -hmm. And so it's more of an, a kind of feeling rather than a, an understanding. Mm -hmm. You say, well, this is the kind of tea I know how I want to approach it. And you approach that with the feeling. I, I don't measure anything. I don't measure how much tea I use. I don't measure how much water I use. Although I use cues that are uh, somewhat around 100 milliliters. And if I use a larger one, it's about 200 milliliters. But I would definitely do not larger. So I know how big my cues are. Mm -hmm. And also the, the water temperature, the, uh, the steeping duration, I wouldn't really measure. I would just mm -hmm. be like, this, this is just, this is the... This moment is not going to come again. And so every time you brew the same tea, it can be again different, which makes it so much more interesting. It's the beauty of tea. It's the beauty of approaching tea in a just um, a natural way. Mm. Not mechanical, not trying to uh, to say... Yeah, measure anything, don't approach it like a chemical mm. experiment almost. Mm. Mm. Uh, so that largely comes from years of experience of brewing tea and a lot of trial and error then? Yeah, trial and error. Basically just, I mean, trial and error is, is like some things go well, some things go bad. But just enjoying tea and drinking tea, tasting tea, talking about tea. So and trial and trial. Trial and trial and trial and trial and, and trial. just <laughs> <laughs> keeping on trialing. Um, all right. How about this specific tea? What so what we are uh, going to be drinking. Sorry, this was a. Uh, so this was our previous tea that we were still sipping on. Let's uh, let's first get that. <laughs> hmm. So the tea that I want to be drinking is uh, this. This is our um, Icho Sencha Mirai. It's a, uh, it's a Sencha, but it's Icho, which means it's slightly withered. The interesting thing with this is that it's before it's processed. Well, let's, let's say this first. After the, um, the harvest. Freshly picked tea leaf is usually brought into the uh, factory and it's immediately processed, which means it's immediately heat treated. For Kamaidicha, they do that in a big frying pan. For Sencha, they do that in a, um, in a steamer. So the tea leaf is steamed to maintain its um, freshness. And with this tea, when it's brought to the factory, it's not immediately processed. It's left to wither a little bit. So it starts to oxidize. And oxidization, when it happens, that is also what happens with um, oolong in the first stages. And also for black tea, before you start the fermentation, you do mm -hmm. a bit of oxidation first, a bit of withering, mm -hmm. where the leaf starts to shrink, it starts to turn brownish a little bit. And so if it's only for a short duration, the leaf doesn't really start to turn brown but some of its components are altered mm -hmm. so that they produce a different kind of aroma. Mm -hmm. And this tea too has been withered slightly before being processed as sencha. So it's a very unique It's very tea. uncommon to do that with sencha because most often uh, producers will want to keep it as 
fresh and mm -hmm. as unpolluted by um, by oxidation. It's considered a um, a bad trait of the tea if your tea has a little bit of oxidation in it. Really? If it's like it has the aromas of a, a wither tea because it affects the blending process. Most of the teas right. in Japan are blended to create an, um, a type of tea that is the same every year. So right. they will want to create something that is generic and that can be reproduced. If you're then going to play around with um, withering and, and more difficult processes of uh, manufacturing of tea, it's, you, you can't keep it consistent. as generic, as consistent. Yeah. So with this tea, this is a single cultivar. The cultivar is uh, called the Mirai. And um, it was produced in Shizuoka, where, well, you can have a look at the, the leaf itself. It's very bright, very green. And let's, uh, well, let's brew that. So what we can expect from this tea is that as a sencha, it's, it's organically grown as well. It's fresh. And it's also slightly more aromatic as to what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. So, Because of that withering process. Because of that withering process. So what am I going to do? This is a kind of tea that I would actually approach with a little bit of um, colder temperature for the first steeping and then increase the temperature for the successive steepings. Mm -hmm. Whereas with other more how should I say, other naturally grown, other um, teas that I want to extract the, the, the fragrance of, I would go with just right off the boil, hot water immediately. But with this one, I would take a... Uh, a cooler water. A cooler water, a, um, a more... Well, an, an, a sh what do I call it? And, uh, <laughs> like A gentle approach, that's what I want to say. So uh, what temperature water are you going to be using or have you used? It should be around 80 degrees. 80 degrees. Well, the, the water that I get is always on the boil. So um, that's why if I transfer the water into the, the teapot here, then it cools down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be using that slightly cooled water. Let's keep talking. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you also poured the water into the um, kusu before you started steeping, before you put the leaves in. Is there any purpose for that? Uh, it's to cool down the water in this case. With other teas, I would actually put the, well, put the hot water in the kusu, pour it out, put the tea leaf in the kusu, and then you warm up the cues basically through mm -hmm. which the tea leaf starts to heat up mm -hmm. and will release more of its fragrances. So you can also enjoy the fragrance of the, the dry leaf before you steep the tea. And I like to take this approach because looking at the tea leaf itself is a pleasant experience. Enjoying the fragrance of the tea leaf itself is a, is a pleasant experience. And then putting that dry tea leaf into the uh, kusu and smelling it again after it's been heated up a little bit by the temperature in the kusu, then that, again, is a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. And then you can get to the drinking. So all these steps that you take before drinking the tea, those allow you to sort of create an anticipation of what you are going to get. So you also don't measure how long you steep the leaves? I don't measure anything. Now tell me what you, um, what mm -hmm. you experience. 
it's very it still has a fairly grassy aroma similar mm -hmm. to other senches but there is definitely a um almost floral yeah aroma that you often get in oolong teas which i assume is from the oxidation or the With withering the withering the yes withering. so if you look at the leaf closely um it's still bright and green but there's are some dots of brown in there and those are indicative of uh, some oxidation some withering so that is where that aroma comes from and it's almost like incense <laughs> a little bit uh... not that we have any incense here that could have affected the flavor just so you know <laughs> here all the, <laughs> all the, the teas tea. kept pure as the tea and I get some, it's almost like the, like it's got coconut aminos. Hmm. It's like coconut sweetness. Coconut. I'll give it to you again so you can taste this. You can try it again. <laughs> hmm. Yes. Hmm. Definitely a very unique green tea. So have a taste of it now that it's... Um, brewed at somewhat a uh, cooler temperature for the next brew i'm just going to go with um right off the boil hot water immediately into the teapot and this will extract much more you can you can feel that you get some of that sweetness that, yes definitely um those umami flavors but it's also quite light yes you think yes so if you brew it at a higher temperature, we'll see what um, that does to the tea. And I'm not going to steep it for too long. I'm just going to, I'm going to pour it out immediately here. So this steeping will be a little bit stronger, more extracted, but not bitter. See, that's the fun. <laughs> that's the fun because you can, you can, you can anticipate. And that is really what you want to do. You want to experience a lot of tea but also anticipate what tea could be and then learn from that experience was your anticipation correct is because technically if you brew it at a higher temperature you're going to get a more intense a more bitter flavor um and then when you really drink the tea is it really aligned mm. and from that experience you can learn oh well certain teas react in a different way mm. so this tea reacted in that way that tea reacted as such and these experiences, when accumulated, give you a very good understanding of um, how to brew teas that you have, haven't drunk before. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost as if you could say that the tea is your teacher. The more tea you drink, the more that you can learn from it. Your teacher? The tea teaches tea you. Teacher. The tea. Oh, well, you're making a pun here. <laughs> it's your teacher. <laughs> And even though you brewed it a very short time, the color is still very bright. Mm -hmm. And that was still the first brew. It's still a very light flavor, but definitely it has changed a bit. Coconut stronger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how tea can sort of remind you of things. I, <clears throat> it's very difficult to pronounce the flavors of a tea you say this tea tastes like such and such or this tea is almost like well, like this one we say this tea tastes like coconut mm -hmm. it's nothing near coconut but it just reminds you of an experience that you've had with another cup another fragrance and well that's i think how it's like with wine you have to get an, a lot of experience with mm -hmm. different tastes flavors and fragrances in order to be able to refer to them mm -hmm. and being able to express the notes that you um, that you can derive from whatever right. you're drinking. So with tea, you need to do sort of the same, but it's much more subtle. And I know, are you getting the coconut that I'm <laughs> talking about? Or are you like, what's this guy uh, talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Mm. 
Not quite. I think I haven't uh, accumulated. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> I haven't quite accumulated as much experience as you have, I suppose. I guess you need to have more coconut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, admittedly, I haven't had very much coconut in my life. <laughs> um, I find it very subjective, really, to mm. say something tastes like mm -hmm. this and that. Right. It strongly depends on the experience that you've had with that other substance. Mm -hmm. So describing flavors and aromas is, is very subjective. Mm, yeah. It smells like my grandmother's closet. I mean, like no one else will ever have smelled your grandmother's closet. But in a way, to you, it can be very significant. Mm, mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a bad smell, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, do you have any advice for people who are just getting, who are just starting the process of accumulating those experiences, maybe something you would have liked to know when you started uh, or years ago, or really based on your own experience of tea? Well, the best advice that I can really give is drink a lot of tea, just experience. It's the process that, is, that makes it fun. And don't get caught up with set ways of brewing. Like you get a tea, brew it whichever way you like and see what you get out of it. Learn from that experience and next time brew it a different way. That same way, like you can get, we've had two steepings. The first steeping was colder. The th second steeping was hotter. We've had two different experiences of the same tea leaf. Now you could still have some left. And next time you brew the first one hotter and you start immediately with that hot brewing. You do shorter infusions. The third time you brew it with a hot temperature and you keep longer infusion times. And each time the tea that you're going to taste is going to be different, although it's the same leaf. So playing around with your steeping durations, with your brewing times, with the amount of tea that you're using, with the temperatures of your water. Those four factors, amount of water, amount of tea leaf, temperature of water, and the steeping duration. Those four factors, those are variable. And you can just play with them like an equalizer. You know, for this song, I want the bass higher and the, uh, the mids lower. And for another song, you might say, I want the, the mids all the way up and the bass go down. Like... <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's like that with tea too. And the more you play with it, the more you will get an understanding for what different ways of brewing do to your tea. But keep in mind that very simply put, a higher temperature of water requires a shorter steeping duration. A lower temperature of water requires a higher steeper, ste uh, steeping duration, so longer. If you keep that in mind, then basically you can just go about and play and figure out what you want to do with your tea. And that is what you need to do. Experience. You might say, well, now I've paid a lot of money for just a little bit, 30 grams of tea. And um, I, I really, for every cup, I want to make it the best experience. I understand that. But I think the best experience you can get is if you experiment. approach it in different ways and experiment and mm -hmm. see different faces of the same tea. How boring is it if one person is like always the same and always saying the same thing yeah. to you? It will get tedious over time. So have some, some variety, have some, mm. some fun with it. Mm. And the other recommendation is uh, read my book. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I wrote a book. It's called The Story of Japanese Tea. And it expresses... But it explains a lot of what Japanese tea is. So I begin with, where does the tea come from? How is it cultivated? How is it harvested? How is it manufactured? Um, what is some of the cultural background of tea? It's very broad and it goes very deep. It goes from the root to the cup. And in between, I have um, added case studies, stories from live tea manufacturers in Japan that approach organic tea farming in a way. And I have kept it at organic farming for that matter, because 
the, most of the producers that I work with are organic tea farmers, and they have a very interesting way of looking at their um, their tea. They're very much in harmony with nature, and from them, I have learned a lot as well. Soil is really important in that matter, and as we know, <clears throat> well, maybe we don't know, but soil is the basis of almost all life on the planet. We've got, we ourselves are soil. We, we come from the earth, we go back to the earth. If you think about it, when we were born, we were this little baby. And then we start eating food and we grow. And the more we grow, well, the more food we eat, the more we grow. And at the end of our life, we go back to the earth. We literally put under the earth and we go back to it. Mm -hmm. So we are just accumulations of the food that we eat. And the food that we eat mostly comes from the earth. I mean, if you're not vegetarian, you eat, you eat cow, let's call it by the name of the animal, <laughs> <laughs> then it's fed with natural material. It, it feeds from grass. Grass right. comes from the earth. So... The earth produces grass, grass gets into the cow and produces more cow. And now we eat the animal and we get basically what the cow, the cow was fed on. Mm. So the grass became the cow, the cow became us. Mm -hmm. We um, develop and we keep our life in, uh, in order. We eat vegetables, vegetables come from the soil. And so everything that we basically consume come from the soil. So soil is very important in, well, as, as a method of sustaining all life on the planet. Now, what we're seeing in Japan with different tea farms is that some tea gardens actually, on purpose, destroy the fertility of the soil. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they, some tea farms on purpose have destroyed the fertility of the soil by chopping off the topsoil. And basically, if you look at the tea garden, it's a, it's a light brown sand soil with no vegetation on it mm -hmm. other than the tea trees. And that is done so that the tea trees that are planted on it too are um, modified tea trees that have a certain, well, basically cultivars that are suitable mm -hmm. to a certain um, area and that are su suitable to the production of a certain kind of tea. So you can predict what it's going to come out mm. like. And if there's no specific fertility in the soil, then you can add the nourishment to it. You can add the fertilizer to the soil mm -hmm. that you want to um, help you create the tea that you want to obtain in the end. Mm. So that is done also because of the, the fact that main tea vendors and tea producers in Japan, they want to create a generic product mm, going back to that consistency going back to that consistency so that every year the tea that you have is the same that the consumer can go to the same store and regardless of if there was a new harvest or not they can the get same the tea. same pack of tea with the same flavor in it mm. and so that most people say it's the blending practices the mm -hmm. the master blenders have their skill, and of course, they, they have their skill mm -hmm. in putting different flavors together so that they, the they always flavor get a, flavor, uh, a consistent flavor out. Mm. But it really starts already at the farm, mm -hmm. where the tea that is being produced is m m sort of guided in a way mm -hmm. that is unnatural. Mm. And knowing that this soil is being destroyed on purpose is to me a sad thing because if you know that in Africa, for example, in India and, and in many places in the world, desertation is going on, that soil is really going extinct and it's just not being fertile. Mm -hmm. it, it's going, the fertility is going lost so that you can't really um, create any food on it very soon really most of the soil on the planet will be infertile and mm. there will be too many human beings to f feed that we don't have the capacity of growing enough food 
to feed everyone. Mm. And there, there will be major issues. So one of the ways to help with that issue is to become more conscious of what soil can do for us and mm. how we, what we should do really to keep soil in a, um, in a, a good condition. So that's, I've also become more conscious about it. And it's, um, I've encountered a, a project that is uh, going on that's actually starting right now. That's called uh, Conscious Planet. And it's a, uh, a project that's uh, started by the Isha Foundation in, uh, uh, in, in, in southern India, mm -hmm. where the, the problem of soil degeneration is actually very... Uh, very large mm -hmm. and they're trying to be group more people together at the moment so that more people throughout the world become conscious of the problem so that every com everyone can work together to in every respective country sort of help with mm -hmm. the regeneration of the soil mm -hmm. and I'm putting on the screen uh, an, a URL to it so you can look it up and also become an, uh, an earth buddy, as they call it, so that everyone can raise their awareness, raise their consciousness about what we can do to help the planet and to make sure that generations to come, because that's really what it's about. We want to leave a planet behind. We want to leave, an, um, we want to leave the world behind after, because our lifespan is so short that the thing that we can do is only make sure that the planet is left behind in such a way that generations to come can also benefit from it and can live an, um, a happy and joyful life. Whereas if we destroy the planet now, then what are we to say to the generations to come? So with organic farming, with organic tea farming in Japan and with organic farming in the world, I think we well should already be able to help the problem and I just wanted to mention this here um, as well so that we can address this um, this problem all right do we have time for a few more questions I believe so um, <clears throat> there were a few questions submitted um, we posted a quiz on the stories a couple of days ago and for anyone who didn't see it the quiz uh, was regarding what causes, what compound causes tea to become bitter when brewed? Um, and the answer, of course, was catechins. But um, Catechins. Catechins. And um, I think a lot of people have heard that it's tannins that cause tea to become bitter. Are those two related? Are they the same? Tannins and catechins? Yes. Um, well, yes. The same category. Same category, basically, yes. Hmm. Um, they both produce bitterness. <laughs> so but Not exactly the same thing, but similar. Well, tannins are more responsible for the astringency. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you... Um, it, it's got this tingy feeling on the inner side of the cheeks that... You have a lot of tannins with, uh, in coffee. Mm. Tannins are, are also more related to, um, to caffeine. Yes. And really the interesting thing with, uh, with matcha is that matcha doesn't have as much tannin as coffee. Although it has a high amount of caffeine, which in tea terms is uh, thin. Mm. <laughs> thin or theanin. And... Um, I think when I talk to my tea ceremony instructor, he's always so happy about matcha that he, he used to work, now he's retired, but he was a professor at a um, university. And he used to work long nights. So he had to reach deadlines and work all night through and stay awake. And he didn't like coffee because Drinking coffee would give him the jitters. Mm -hmm. And so having to drink coffee throughout the night would actually aggravate your uh, situation more and also disturb your concentration. 
Whereas he would say, I would, I would make myself a bowl of koicha, mm. like really thick uh, matcha, like you have uh, very formally in the tea ceremony. And usually one bowl of koicha would get him through the night. He would get tired, but he would stay awake, not being able to sleep, mm-hmm. and also stay alert without getting the jitters. Without getting jitters. And getting those jitters, he related to... Uh, well, it being a, an effect of tannins. Hmm. So tea has much less tannin, really, than, um, than coffee. Hmm. Hmm. So what makes tea bitter? Well, we could say that the, uh, the answer to that is uh, catechins. And it's <clears throat> we could take that a step further. We could actually say that it's the fertilization or the over-fertilization of conventional teas that enhances the amount of amino acids in the tea leaf Mm -hmm. too much, to such an extent that there's so much amino acids in the tea leaf that through photosynthesis, when the tea is uh, reached by sunlight, is um, also producing an immense amount of catechins, which Mm -hmm. is above the natural amount. And if you produce that much amount of catechins, then your tea is inevitably going to get much bitter. Right. So are all of the teas in your shop uh, produced in a way that does not, a natural way, that doesn't turn bitter when brewed? Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. At the tea crane, there are only organic, naturally produced, or um, pesticide-free teas. Some of them have a little bit of organic fertilization, mm-hmm. but no pesticides have been used to whatever, uh, whatever extent. And I look mostly for absolutely natural teas because an idea, not really an idea, but my perception of tea and what I want to achieve with tea is to go back to the natural approach, mm-hmm. to go back to um, what tea tasted like 100 years ago. And this is something that I would definitely want to dedicate another, um, another session to. And I'm actually planning an, um, a workshop in April where I want to go deeper into this topic of what is um, the face of tea as it was 100 years ago. Mm. Because tea in Japan, well, commonly, we would say that in the 1200s, Zen master Esai brought tea from China, the tea seeds, and then matcha culture happened. Um, there's much more to the story. And <laughs> actually, there's since the 600s already tea uh, grown in Japan, but that was a different type of tea. And it, th- there's a lot again to the history. That's a whole other, a whole other uh, subject. But let's take that from the 1200s, tea has been grown and produced and consumed in Japan. It's been a very important part of the culture. Now we get to the 1950s and the 1970s, where chemistry is, uh, well, propels. Uh, Different chemical components are being discovered. Chemical Mm -hmm. approaches that use chemicals are being discovered. And all of a sudden, agriculture as a whole has to shift towards this use of agrochemicals, fertilizer, etc., Whereas that didn't exist for the 750 years before that. Mm. And now all of a sudden, tea needs to be fertilized or you can't produce a tea that has this amount of amino acids and um, flavor and is too labor intensive if we don't use our pesticides because then we have to take our bugs off um, by hand and we can't spray the the weeds and then we have to pull them out by hand. And there's all these complaints. It has made life for the producer easier. Mm. But before that, Well, not a lot of tea was produced. It was quite an exclusive thing. It wasn't as widely available as it was now. We have done very good in a way to make tea a commodity that can be commercialized and consumed in a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. But it has not improved the quality of tea. On the contrary. Mm. So what I want to do is to go back to 100 years ago at least and see how was tea produced then, what was the kind of tea that grew in Japan? And what does that la- taste like? And what are the benefits of drinking that kind of tea? That's what I want to do with mm. um, uh, the tea crane. And on this subject, in uh, mid-April, 
in uh, I don't remember the exact date. It's I think the seventeenth. Uh, it's a Sunday. I will be doing an um, a course on exactly this subject. So be there. Looking forward <laughs> to it. All right, that wraps up all the questions that I have. Thank, right. thank you to everyone who asked any questions. We have a few more questions here in the uh, comments on uh, YouTube. Let's have a look. Um, there are two questions here that I uh, want to address. Would you like to give insights on flavors of different tea in depth, especially of oolong and green tea separately? Now, it's a very broad question, and um, I think I would say green tea, the main trait of green tea is that it's not oxidized. It's not being withered. <clears throat> so it has this fresh, grassy flavor that um, an oolong also has. But in addition to that, it has been withered and oxidized before manufacturing so that some more floral or herbal notes get into the tea as well. And for green tea, I like to brew it at a higher temperature and a shorter period of time, especially with organic teas, because that expresses more of its aroma. But you also get these, um, the bitterness and the, um, the sweetness of the tea that are, well, especially agreeable. And in green tea, I feel that the bitterness is a very important aspect of the tea. Now, if we think of bitterness in tea, then we usually think of the too bitter flavor if we oversteep our tea. Mm -hmm. That's not the kind of bitterness that I'm talking about with these kinds of teas. The kind of bitterness that I'm talking about is a vegetal bitterness that you have, for example, in um, vegetables like um, asparagus or chicory or... Um, a, oh, look, it's snowing. Oh, Hello, hey, everyone, it's snowing in Kyoto. <laughs> I just realized <laughs> I got excited. <laughs> Sorry, I got carried away. So with oolong, you have more of this fresh, floral, vegetal um, aroma. And for that, I would take even shorter steeping durations. I would steep it at a very high temperature and only take 20 seconds, for example, and do mm -hmm. it for multiple steeping so that it's just really the aroma that you're, um, you're savoring. Mm. That's what I would do with, uh, with oolong. Now let's have a look at another question here. I have heard that some waters are best for tea, spring or mineral water. What water sources do you recommend? That's a very good question. And um, generally, as it has been um, transmitted, even in the time of um, the, uh, well, the, what do you call that? The, the Sutra of Tea, the, uh, the Chakyo. Um, this, the tea is usually best brewed with the water from the area where it was grown. Because all that tea production is, is a tea grows with the nourishment of its area. And like we, um, we drink a lot of water. Mm -hmm. We are com comprised of a lot of water. The tea tree is a lot of water. When you um, obtain the tea leaf, what you want to do in the processing is to extract the water that is in the tea leaf. And the mm -hmm. tea leaf itself is also um, 80 to 90 percent water. And you take that all out there. Yeah. And by kneading the tea in different ways, mm -hmm. by heating the tea in a certain way, you extract that water. Mm -hmm. And some of the producers that I work with would even go as far as to say they are guiding the water in the tea leaf, the, uh, the humidity, the moisture, out of the tea leaf through its veins and try not to forcibly squeeze it out. And that is what these different um, rolling techniques, airing techniques, um, heating techniques are about. So in the end, the tea that you've obtained is a dry leaf and when you brew that tea you want to add water to it again again through its veins that leaf is going to mm -hmm. absorb the, the water mm -hmm. and it's going to regain its natural its, its original form so if you give the same water that you've extracted back to the tea leaf you're going to get the flavor out 
without any interruption of the flavor of the water itself, because mm -hmm. it's the same type as the one that the tea has been uh, nourished with. You get least interference. If you get water from somewhere else, it might have different components and it might sort of affect the way that the, the tea leaf absorbs it, the way that it gives off its flavors. Mm -hmm. And that being said, we know that in Japan, most of the water is soft water. So soft water means that it's got a um, low residue amount. So that's around 100 milligrams per liter dry rest. Dry rest is the, is, is the word I was looking for, yeah. So we want to use as much as um, soft water as possible for mm -hmm. brewing green tea. So if you are drinking green tea outside of Japan, and especially in, in Europe, I know that a lot of the water there is, is, is especially uh, hard. Mm -hmm. Like a lot, a lot of, of extra, a lot of extras in, in the tap water, especially mm -hmm. when I go back to Belgium and I drink water from the tap after drinking the water, it. I get even more thirsty than I was before I drank the water. It's just, it dries out my throat and I can ta really taste the, uh, the chalk in it. It's mm. like very chalky. That can't be good for tea, for the taste. No, definitely not. Um, if you whisk a matcha with that, your matcha turns black. Oh, <laughs> that's alarming. <laughs> with a very ugly yellow bubble foam. Ew. So you might just want to try it. Get, get like a water. <laughs> like uh, th That's a fun experiment to do, actually. You just get a, um, a water like uh, Contrex, which is very, very, very hard water. It's like mm. above a thousand milligrams uh, dry rest. Mm. <clears throat> And you try whisking a matcha with that. You'll see how, how ugly your tea is. <laughs> like. And then try doing that the same thing with soft water and see how, how beautiful, frothy, and a nice, colorful mm. foam that you get. So, uh, yes, soft water for Japanese tea. And if you're outside of Japan, look for um, some bottled water. Don't look for too much minerals because um, in Belgium, there's this water called spa. I'm... I don't know some other um, other waters, but spa is very rich in iron, mm -hmm. and you know iron in water, it you can taste it. Yes. So it is a very light water. It's a very um, uh, should I say soft water, but the iron is very prominent. So you get your tea flavor with a strong iron mm, taste, which does not mix well with tea flavors. I would imagine. Um, all right. Let's take one last question. And then uh, I think we're going to wrap up for the day. We've um, stretched this out to an hour. It's been very enjoyable. Um, so I've got this uh, question on the screen. What are your preferred methods for brewing different whole leaf tea varietals and serving them? Uh, side handle, teapot, tea bowl, shibori dashi, small cup, glass, etc. So I'll, I'll keep it very short. The way that I like to brew my tea is with these types of um, kyusu. These are ceramic kyusu, from, uh, mostly from Tokoname in, um, in Aichi Prefecture in Japan. I like to use these, and I like to use these very little ones. Why? Because it gives you the opportunity to, with smaller cups, have small portions of tea, and you can have more kinds of tea. You can have different types of tea to go throughout the day and you don't have to drink liters of it. So it's, <clears throat> and it's also more intimate. You make a little bit of tea mm. and you feel how precious it is. Really savor it. So you can really savor it. And I think even this is about 100 milliliters, 90 milliliters to 100 milliliters size teapot. And um, it's just... It's enough for three people with these small cups. Mm -hmm. And everyone has enough because you get really a, a full flavor. If you add enough tea leaf, you can brew your tea in such a way that it's, it's almost like having a, um, a kind of liquor. Mm. And you savor that mm -hmm. just little sip by little sip and you get an idea of what the, the tea tastes like. And next you have a second brew and a third brew. And mm -hmm. you, that, that's how I, uh, how I like to approach the tea. And also very... Um, very deliberately, you look at the you look at the leaf, you savor the aroma of the tea, 
you get an anticipation of what the tea is going to taste like. And then in the end, uh, you brew it and you go through this different, different steeping, mm -hmm. uh, well, these different steepings. Yeah. So, okay. Right, think... Anything that you would like to add at the end? Um, yeah, I think we got through all of the questions. Thank you for all of the information. Very insightful. Um, and thank it, everyone again who submitted questions. Um, thank you for your time. Thank everyone Thanks. for joining our, uh, our live. I'd be very happy to uh, do this again. You can always send in questions. Um, currently, we don't have an idea yet of an, um, a set time to do this, but I'll be doing this more frequently. So stay tuned on YouTube. Facebook is where we usually do the stream and announcements will be made on, uh, on Instagram. So be sure to follow the T crane on Instagram so that you get the notifications of when we are going to go live again. And today we mostly talked about the catechin components, how, how tea gets, um, gets bitter and well, different ways of approaching brewing tea and enjoying tea. But there are so many more different topics that can be covered. So um, I'd be looking forward to talking more, doing this more often. And if you're interested into, well, going a little bit deeper in learning about tea, I will be doing a um, full lecture on how I perceive tea as what it was a hundred years ago. So to go beyond the conventional farming methods and to look back at authentic um, the original ways of how tea was grown and then also take a few case studies from a few uh, regions throughout Japan and really um, do an, a thorough study of, uh, of that subject. Then um, look out for the, uh, the announcement that I'll be making about the lecture in uh, early April or well, mid-April, April 17th, I think it was. But those announcements will also be made on um, Facebook, Instagram, for sure. So stay tuned, stay posted. And um, well, thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy your tea and have a nice day. <laughs>